And so I studied uh, Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. And that will be our passage for this afternoon. Now we have seen that our nation is too divided. Uh, if you are hearing uh, news, uh, watching TV, uh, you will be exasperated uh, with what is going on. Our leaders are too divided. They quarrel. They assert they own their own rights. They um, simply are... Uh, bent to fight with one another. There is so much struggle for, for power. That is what is happening in our nation. And the church is not spared from this kind of problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, it says, But I, brothers, could not address you as a spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not, not solid food, but you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and having only, behaving only in a human way? And even James said in chapter 4, verse 1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You do not have because uh, you are, uh, your heart is not uh, right before God. And this is a, a problem even in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is so much division. There is so much quarreling, criticizing, complaining. And that should not be in the church of Christ. But it is happening. And so Romans 15, 1 to 7, Paul is saying here that the community of God's people ought to conduct themselves totally different from the world. It is not a self-seeking, self-importance or self-assertion uh, attitude in the church. But rather, it should be... Uh, the importance of others, it should be the interest of others. It is not pleasing myself, but it is pleasing others. Now, that is what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. And reading from verse 7, it says, Therefore welcome one another, as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Christ has accepted us. And so, therefore, you must accept one another. The strong and the weak, we must accept one another. Those who has and those who has not, we must accept one another. Those who are uh, um, strong and mighty and those who are weak, we must accept one another. He redeemed us. He justified us. He changed us. But the strong and the weak in conscience, both the strong and the weak in conscience, we must accept one another for the sake of unity and for the sake of God's glory. The interest of others must take precedence before our own interest. If I ask you this afternoon, what is a Christian? What is your idea of a Christian? If I'm talking to you as a Christian and you as a Christian, what do you understand about a Christian? A Christian is someone who belongs to Christ. A Christian is someone who is a follower, a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the orientation of the life of a Christian? The orientation of the life of a Christian is not about self. It's not about me. It's about others. It's about what I can do for others. That is the orientation of the life of a Christian. It's about doing good to others. It's about the interest of others, not self. The Lord has given us the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And it clearly teaches us the attitude of self-giving, of thinking about the good of others. What is the summary of the Decalogue in Mark chapter 12? Love God with all your mind, with all your heart, and with, your, with all your soul. And then, love your neighbor, even before you love yourself. 
The commandment tells us, do not love yourself first, but love God first and then love others before you love yourself. The Ten Commandments of God teaches us the priority, the orientation of the life of a Christian. We are to love God above all and then love others before we love our own selves. I hope you understand what it means to be a Christian. And if you are not thinking, if you are only thinking about yourself, your own interests, how important you are, your own concerns for yourself and not others, examine your own heart this afternoon. You are not living as a Christian because the orientation of your life should be what I can do for the good of others. So the context of Romans chapter 15, 1 to 7, actually is, it's, it's a conclusion of chapter 14 where Paul was addressing the issue of Christian liberty. There, Paul is saying, one's freedom to do what is right should take a backseat over the good of others. In chapter 14, verse 1, Paul says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. Right? That is what Paul said in verse 1. And then verse 19, Paul says, um, so then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual uh, edification or upbuilding. And the point is, Paul is saying in chapter 14, when you exercise your Christian liberty, whether it is your right to do something, avoid anything that will ruin the peace and the harmony of the church. Avoid anything that will not be for the edification of others. Avoid anything that will result in disharmony or quarreling. That is what Paul is saying in verse 14, 15, for, uh, chapter 14. Whether, uh, what you are, whether your conviction tells you that this is right, this is right to do for you, you... As a believer, deny yourself of that right for the sake of others who are weak in their conscience. Do not trample the rights of those who are weak. So here in verses 1 to 2, Paul brings into conclusion the obligation of the strong over the weak. He identifies himself with the strong. Because in chapter 14, verse 14 and 15, Paul says that, I know... And I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it, is, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one whom Christ died. So brethren, Paul is saying there, you know, I'm, I belong to the group who I consider strong because... They, we believe that all that God has given us for consumption, uh, food, they're all clean. Because nothing that uh, goes into the stomach will make a person unclean. But everything that will simply come out of the heart, that is uh, what makes a person unclean. So for the Apostle Paul, there is nothing wrong. But he would not use that right to trample trample. Uh, over those who are weak in their conscience. Paul would not use his freedom to trample the weak in conscience. He would rather deny himself of what is right to him for the good and edification of others. Now, the general pr principle that Paul is teaching there here is that we should be people who are other-pleasing, not self-pleasing. That is the general principle, brethren, that Paul is teaching here in... Uh, in uh, chapter 14 and then uh, the conclusion in chapter, the reflection here in chapter 15. The general principle is pleasing others, not pleasing myself. And that should be every believer's duty. Always do what is good and edifying for others. Brethren, that's not easy. Um, it entails self-denying attitude. 
My rights should be subordinate to the rights of others. And the Bible is very clear on that. If you are a believer, these words speak to you. You are a believer who is out there not to please yourself, but to please others. That is the orientation of your life as a believer. So the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, and he said, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Brethren, the point there is this should characterize the community of God's people. We should be other pleasers, not self-pleasers. And this should govern our conduct in the church. Brother, I just simply want to ask you, does that characterize your life? Are you a man? Are you a woman? Who is there to please others, not yourself? That you are willing to deny yourself of any rights for the sake of the good of others and for the edification of others. And Paul mentioned here, Two beneficial consequence um, towards the attitude of pleasing others, and the first one is what we found in verse five. What we find in verse five, when Paul says, "May the God uh, of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with, with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus," and here Paul is saying. Through the scriptures, God grants endurance and encouragement with the purpose of living in harmony or unity with one another. And that is what is the purpose of seeking to please others, not ourselves. It is to preserve the unity of the church. It is to strengthen the harmony of the church. And the second Beneficial consequence is in verse 6 when Paul said that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying there, if we are living as we ought to, as believers, uh, on pleasing others rather than pleasing ourselves, with one voice, we are glorifying God. How can we, with one voice, glorify God when we do not have unity, when we have conflicts, when we have quarrels, when we have complaints with one another? Brethren, don't you see the evil of this unity? Self-seeking, self-assertion, self-importance ruins unity and hinders believers. In glorifying God. Now look at this. On the other hand, pleasing others instead of ourselves strengthens unity, harmony, and gives us united voice to glorify God. We know, and you know, that in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, we are commanded to glorify whatever you do, whether you eat or drink. Do this, all of this for the glory of God. So if I ask you what is the first question in our shorter catechism, children, what is the first question in our shorter catechism? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Thank you. That is God's design for you. My, breth my brethren, you are there to glorify God. And to enjoy Him forever. And Paul understand that this is difficult to do. As I always say, 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 we have been changed, empowered, but we have not yet been perfected. The self will keep appearing its ugly head. How can we consider the good of those who oppose us and hurt us? I know. I've counseled many of you. You just cannot forgive someone who has offended you. You just cannot settle with the person uh, who has done things 
you so much dislike. You cannot even look at that person. You wouldn't want to go to church and see that person. And that's a problem, as we can see. How can we consider the good of those who are stubborn and keep on causing trouble? How can we please those who never want to please us? Right? Our natural tendency is to simply hate those who hate us, not to love those who do not love us. Brethren, I know and Paul understand, it's really difficult to live by this principle of always thinking about the good of others, of always seeking to please others before pleasing ourselves. It is difficult, I know. But Paul here gives us two ways that will make us endure and be encouraged to always think of the good of others, even when it is too difficult for us. So in verse 3, he gave, uh, Paul gives the first reason, look at the example of Christ. And then the second re reason is in verse 4, look at the testimony of the scriptures. And the first one, the example of Christ, in verse 3, it says, For Christ did not please Himself, but as it is written, the reproaches, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. Now, that is a quotation of Psalm 69 and verse 9. Uh, we read that in our scripture reading. Now, Paul is saying the mission of Christ in going to this fallen world is not to please himself, but to please others. I hope you understand that. Understand that. And he said that the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. In Psalm 69, the, the insults that people are throwing to God are thrown to him. It fell on him. But to extend that, we see that Christ, all the offense that we did to God, are all imputed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was speaking about what Christ has bore upon Himself for, uh, uh, for, for our sake. He bore our sins. Our sins were imputed to Him. The reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. Paul is saying that, look, the way of the cross is his greatest, is the greatest example of self-giving. It's an other-pleasing work. Just look at the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came here and went to the cross and died for us. How do you understand that? Is he seeking to please himself? No. He's, he did that for us. And so, uh, Mark 10, 45 tells us, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for many. He came, the Lord Jesus Christ, not to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for many. Now you know, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Christ came for our sake, not for him, not for his sake, but for us. There is nothing clearer than in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, when Paul said, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, to the point of death, even death on a cross. Do you, do you, have you ever considered that Christ, who is God, did, did not regard himself equality with God, but rather he became poor, he became like one of us, to the point of death 
on the cross. For whom? For, for sinners, for us, my brethren. And that is what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us. The point is the way of the cross indeed is the greatest example of self-giving and other pleasing work. So let's just reflect on these brothers. Consider the self-sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for you. Whenever you find it difficult to deny yourselves for the, for the good of others or for the edification of others, for the edific edification of the church, brethren, just look to what Christ has done for an unworthy sinner like you. You don't deserve the love, the grace, the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ. What, why would Christ die for you? You are a rebellious, wicked person. If Christ would do what you deserve, will give you what you deserve, you, will, you only deserve His wrath, His judgment. You only deserve what Christ can just simply do to you. He, can, he would bring you to hell because that is what you deserve. And yet, Christ came not to please Himself, but to please a sinner like you. Now, how big and how great is that offense that you cannot forgive? For the sake of unity, for the sake of one voice glorifying God, what are those things that you cannot simply deny yourself? When Christ, by His own example of love, He came to give Himself and to please others, not Himself. Now, the second here... Um, a way to, endure, uh, to make us endure and be encouraged to always think of the good of others is the testimony of the Scriptures. It says in verse 4, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now, isn't that very beautiful? Um, the apostles always cite the Old Testament scriptures for our example. As an example for us. Now, it is either warning us or encouraging us. But Paul here is directing our attention to the scripture that, would, that encourages us, that makes us endure. In our lives. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. This is a warning against the sin of the people of Israel. And verse 6, it says, Now these things took place as example for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. We already have the warning there. The warning is um, they were guilty of idolatry and persistent complaining against gods who, brought, who delivered them out of Egypt. And then verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Brethren, the scripture were given to us for our instruction to give us, to help us endure and to be encouraged in our duties, uh, in our Christian duties. The, the passage in Psalm 69 and verse 9 teaches that the scripture, the scripture, uh, scripture's central teaching is the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read the Old Testament scripture, you will find the Lord Jesus Christ there. When you read some uh, Isaiah chapter 53, you cannot escape thinking about 
the Lord Jesus Christ because it's all about the servant, the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. It all points to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they, are, and, they, and they were written for our instruction. Now to us, brethren, we do not only have the Old Testament Scriptures, we have the completed canon, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the 66 books of the Bible. And it's so... It's a, gr a great and massive book for our instruction that we may learn from all of it. Now, the reformers, as we know, we inherited the doctrine of sola scriptura, scriptura, scripture alone. And that refers to both the doctrine and practice, faith and life. The sufficiency of scriptures teaches not only what we should believe, but also how we should live. Now, the infamous words of Martin Luther, Here I stand. We have just heard that uh, because it's the 500th year of the Reformation. And that was predicated by the words, My thoughts are captive by the word of God. He was able to say, Here I stand, because he says that my thoughts are captive by the word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, 16 to 17, we have all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now let us just ask ourselves. So let me just ask you, do you believe in the sufficiency of the scriptures? Do you believe that the scripture is sufficient for everything that you need to, uh, to know about God, about salvation? Do you believe? Do you believe that the scripture is sufficient to guide you in how you should live? Do you believe that? Or do you still consult other sources for your guide? The scripture is sufficient. We all believe that. And I would just challenge you. If you believe that the scripture is, uh, is sufficient for faith and practice, for doctrine and life, we have the whole of the scripture for our instruction. It will make us endure. It will make us... Uh, it will give us encouragement to go on in our Christian duties. No matter how difficult it is to live pleasing others, the scripture will tell you that you can because that is how God wants us to live. Look at the example of Christ and look at the testimony of the scripture. The scripture, Paul tells us here, serves for two purposes. It brings endurance and encouragement. And brethren, when we open the pages of the Scriptures, it will serve its purpose to make us endure and be encouraged in our Christian duties. Now, the outcome of the sufficiency of the Scripture is a sure hope. A hope both present and eternal. That hope when the self is no longer our enemy. When sin can no longer trouble us. When sin cannot simply uh, make us ruin our unity. When sin simply can simply create disharmony. When sin can simply make us forget about glorifying God. When we are all in heaven, with one voice, we shall glorify our God. And uh, that is the purpose as, as, we, can, as we see of the scripture. It brings endurance and encouragement so that we might have hope. I hope when the sin of selfishness, self-centeredness is no longer in existence. Meanwhile, in this life, brethren, while we are still in this body corrupted by sin, we struggle 
And we need a lot of endurance and encouragement from the scriptures to be able to do what is good for others and the edification of others. We need to learn more of pleasing others before ourselves. So we have seen the example of Christ and the testimony of the scripture to help us endure and be encouraged to overcome the temptation to use self to ruin the harmony of the church and fail to glorify God. Let us emulate Paul and above all the Lord Jesus Christ. We must, our lives, be characterized by a life of pleasing others before ourselves. Brethren, I beg you, I hope that all of us can show and exemplify this life principle of pleasing others before ourselves. Let us not allow the want of self to ruin the peace and harmony of the church. Let us live to please others more than ourselves. Let us, my brethren, with one voice glorify God. And we can only do that if we will think of the good of others before ourselves. Examine ourselves, brethren. Humble yourselves before God. Ask yourself this afternoon, am I truly living to please others, to seek the good of others? Am I helping in strengthening the unity of the church, the harmony of the church? Am I being used in the church so that all the more we shall all with one voice glorify God? Or are you a hindrance? That's a question for you. But friends, have you been accepted by Christ? Now, you can only accept others if you have been accepted by Christ. Do you understand what Christ has done on the cross to save a sinner like you? Do you understand about his sacrifice, about his self-giving sacrifice? Do you understand that he came, the Son of God, came, became man, and walked on this earth, and went to the cross and died for sinner as a substitute. Do you understand what he did on the cross for a sinner, for the salvation of a sinner? My friend, I'm inviting you now. May you understand what it means to be a Christian. And first of all, may you understand how you may be able to live, uh, to, to be saved, and to live as a redeemed person. Repent and believe. You will understand this principle of giving oneself for the good and edification of others. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for reminding us in this passage. We know that the pages of Scripture never, never teach that the priority of your people is self. In fact, it is sinful to be self-centered, to be selfish. Oh Lord, we have seen the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen the testimony of the Scripture. It points to, to, the, to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, to His self-giving love. Help us to live the same. Always make the Bible an open book for us. Whenever we find it difficult to live the principle of seeking to, seeking to please others, forgive us for our sins, our Lord. Forgive us if we have caused your people to be disunited and not to with one voice glorify you. Forgive us, O Lord. Heal us. Make us indeed a church and a people, a community of your people who seek there, who live to please others or one another than pleasing ourselves. Help us to love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul. And help us to love others and before we love ourselves. 
Lord, this is not easy. This is not easy. Help us by your grace and mercy. Help us to live by this principle. And we commit our friends, boys and girls, and even those who are aged or who are grown-up people, we commit them to you. May they have an understanding of what Christ did when he came and gave himself for sinners for their salvation. May you convict them of their sin, come to Christ, repent and believe in order to be saved, and so that they may understand the principle of self-giving life of a Christian. So we commit all these things to you in Christ's most precious name. Amen.